Hello and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing Greenbelt, which is the uh, Christian festival that's based in uh, Cheltenham, which took place last weekend. Sadly, Greenbelt are taking a very anti-Israel position in which they're swallowing much of the lies and the uh, propaganda put out by the uh, Palestinian PR machine that's aimed to delegitimize the uh, state of Israel. Welcome to the Middle East Report. To discuss uh, Greenbelt, I'm joined by Pastor Mike Fryer from uh, Christians uh, for Zion. Uh, Mike, it's a great pleasure to have you on, on the Middle East Report. And uh, firstly, I want to say thank you for the wonderful stand you're making on behalf of Israel, particularly uh, what's happening at Greenbelt. For, for our viewers who are very familiar with you, because I know that uh, quite a few years ago you were regularly on, on Revelation TV, but can you share with us a little bit about your background, how you became a believer, and, more, and also how you became such a passionate advocate of Israel and the Jewish people? Well, I became a believer 18 years ago uh, as a police detective. So I'm interested in justice and truth and all those things that, that you associate with the, the police work. And um, when I began to read the Bible and look at the, the, the prophecies concerning Israel, I realized that, God, that Israel has a big place in God's heart and his plan for the future is connected to Israel. And, and that for me is, is the foundation of the, the reason for what I do uh, with regard to Israel. And uh, I first went there in 1967, but I didn't go back there until 2003. And during those times, there were suicide bombings, there were uh, bombings in hotels, in restaurants, and on buses. And uh, I, I got involved with the people and realized that actually they were just people like you and I who were trying to live in peace with this constant threat of terror upon them. So that's really why I am doing what I'm doing today. So thanks for inviting me, Simon. That's nice. A, it's, a, it's a pleasure. But also, um, you attended the uh, Yad Vashem Holocaust uh, Studies course. Uh, it was organized by the uh, Christian Friends of uh, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Um, what were your experiences of being in Jerusalem at the uh, Holocaust Museum? And, and what did you learn from that, that course? Well, I did a four-year course, which, which was... Uh, uh, before the Christian desk was opened in Yad Vashem. And, uh, and, and the, the things that I did was to study the history of the church, to study the, the uh, time leading up to the Holocaust. And, I, and what that course did for me was give me an understanding for two things. Firstly, that the Jews were dehumanized. Because um, if you dehumanize a people group or a nation or individuals, you're able to kill them. I experienced that in the police force where, where I dealt with murders and was part, part of murder investigations. If the victim was dehumanized by the perpetrator, it made it much easier to kill them. And that's what I realized had happened before the Holocaust. And the evidence is that the church played a role in that. And, and, and uh, historians like Stephen Haynes and, and many other historians would say that without Christendom, the Holocaust couldn't have taken place because we played a big role in dehumanizing the Jew in the last 1700 years. And even up to the, in 1933, when uh, publications were, were made by church leaders in their magazines to say the Jews were pigs and they, were, they, they had no right to live in, in Europe and they were the problems for uh, European uh, social uh, decay. So that was the first thing. And secondly, the thing I learned was that there are four groups in any genocide, including Holocaust. And, and those groups are, the first one are the victims, which clearly were the Jews and also uh, homosexuals and uh, Freemasons and Serbs and, and gypsies. Then there were the perpetrators, who were clearly the Nazi party and, and, and those associated with the Nazi party. And then we have the, um, the bystanders, who were those who stood by and did nothing, and of course the rescuers, and I guess uh, um, 
we all know uh, Schindler being probably one of the most famous rescuers. But uh, what I realized is that the church became probably the biggest bystander because 95% of Germany were Christian. And uh, we stood by and, and allowed that. Now, I'm not judging the people there because they could have been arrested and their whole families would have been uh, executed it, had they been caught helping Jews. But the fact remains that they stayed silent in the years preceding the war. And when um, anti-Semitic remarks were made by their clergy and their leaders, they sat back and did nothing. And that's, that's given me an understanding of the place we need to be in the sense of we need to be a voice and be outspoken and, and, and we all need to help because it's the lives of people that we're talking about and, and their rights of a, to have a nation of their own. So. No, I couldn't agree uh, more with you and uh, certainly looking at, back at that period of history, um, there was so much uh, silence really and so much even support for the kind of Nazi party despite the fact that Hitler had written Mein Kampf um, uh, despite the fact the uh, Jewish community were being targeted with the uh, Nuremberg race laws and everything else, the, the church on a whole kind of embraced the whole Nazi movement. So uh, this is obviously something that we can learn from today, is that the Jewish people are his precious people, and it's our duty to stand up for them and, and to speak on their behalf. Mm. Uh, and that's exactly what you're doing in your opposition to uh, Greenbelt. Now, can you share with our viewers uh, what the Greenbelt Festival is and why they're taking an anti-Israel position? Well, that, that's a big question. But it, Greenbelt began as an evangelical Christian movement. And, and I've spoken to people who were there right in the beginning, you know, kind of uh, people who are now in their 50s who tell me that, that that was absolutely a fantastic festival. It engaged young people with the, uh, with the, the, the contemporary methods of, of providing the gospel to the world through music and art and, and all those things. And, uh, and, and it focused solely on, on the gospel message. And, and that was the thrust of Greenbelt. But in the last three or four years, certainly Greenbelt has changed. The music is still there. Certainly the, 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 the music is a central point of Greenbelt. But the thrust and the messages have changed. And, and in the last three years, the message has become very political and very anti-Israel. And, and speakers like Claire Short have spoken at Greenbelt, who uh, is a, a politician who has a very anti-Israel stance and, and a worrying stance with regard to, to the nation of Israel. And, uh, and in, the last, in these last three years, they've kind of continued with that uh, message to such an extent that they've refined it and empowered it to, um, to uh, uh, teach basically hatred to a, a wide range of Christians who would attend. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that looks at the uh, Christian festival known as uh, Greenbelt, and uh, this year was their 40th anniversary. Just gives you a kind of feel of uh, Greenbelt as a festival. Stand the old-fashioned language, and what we wanted was a language that was relevant <laughs> more than anything else. We wanted to be relevant in the world. James, who had this vision that if the Christians all went into the field and all used the same toilet, so to speak, um, they'd get on with their lives and sort out the important things. I remember the year of the Witch and the Willies, and um, that was extraordinary. It was outrageous. Both those things together rather made it difficult for Greenbelt uh, on, on a PR level. Controversy has dogged the festival. Some of the leadership from where I am from um, wouldn't allow us to take groups of young people to Greenbelt. We lost thousands of people, and we lost thousands of pounds as well in one year. We actually took a vote for the festival to close. I think what happened to Odell, though we loved it there, we just got too big for it. So we looked and um, we moved to Nebworth 
and we were quite excited because we were going to put the stage roughly where the Rolling Stone stage had been. Some Irish guy says he wants to come to the festival tomorrow and it turned out to be The Edge. Once the move to Cheltenham had been made, then the Angel community made absolute sense. This year, Green Melt's 40. The most interesting bit is maybe the next 40. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, Mike, we saw that clip on there that gives us uh, an understanding of what Greenbelt is for those of us who haven't been like myself. I've never been to Greenbelt. Uh, I've heard of Greenbelt, but never actually been. But um, what are your major concerns and grievances concerning Greenbelt and certainly regarding the position they're taking on Israel that uh, has caused you to rally uh, 100 Christians in, in protest at what they're doing? Greenbelt have an agenda which is not a Christian agenda. That's the, th that's the main reason. And that agenda is being forced forward by people, leaders within the Christian community, who again don't have a Christian agenda or a biblical agenda for Israel. And, uh, and Greenbelt has, has become the platform for much of that anti-Israel rhetoric. They're, one of their phrases is, we're here for social justice. Well, I think, th more importantly, we need to be here for truth and justice. That's the key. We need to be people of truth and we need to be people of justice. And their platform of social justice, or their idea of social justice for the Palestinians has, has, is removing the rights of the Jews for justice. And uh, there is no um, uh, m middle ground for them. They don't want to hear about uh, the, the stories of the Jews who have been killed throughout throughout the last 60 or 70 years through suicide bombings, attacks by Arabs, uh, the states around them attacking them. They don't want to hear that story at all. They don't want to hear that the, the wall, the security fence, is a, a fence to defend Jewish people from suicide bombers. They, they literally don't want to hear the other side of it. And that was why on Sunday we went with about 120 Christians to ask them to hear the other side of the story. And uh, also, I think you've approached the organisers as well by trying to get a, a pro-Israel speaker, haven't you? And uh, they've also declined at that. That's right. The, the, I, I was aware that they had declined a speaker from uh, the Council of Christian and Jews and, and, and other offers of a speaker. And uh, I... I I think it's important that we have two sides to a story when you've got a huge number of people at Greenbelt, maybe between 15 and 20,000 attending there, that everybody has a balanced view. When I spoke to Paul Northup and his uh, assistant Abby on Sunday, they, they said, and quite rightly, they, they, they were writing their statement saying, we have a right to choose our own speakers. But actually, they're, they're right in that, but they have a, a responsibility to teach truth. They don't have a right to misinform. And that's another aspect of, of this festival, which is, which is worrying. It, it's misinformation. Nobody has the right to give it misinformation about a people group and cause uh, Christians within the UK to, to begin to hate a country like Israel. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now. It's entitled The uh, Forgotten uh, People and uh, the issue of Israel and the Palestinians has almost become a central theme of the uh, festival of uh, Greenbelt. Hello, my name is Sui Ang, Dr. Sui Ang. I'm a medical doctor. Now, if you look at me, I'm just a Chinese looking woman and you don't want to hear about Palestine from me but I want you to see beyond all this and look away from me and hear what I've got to say about 20 years, 28 years of my experience with these people and that will completely change your stereotypic view about them. 
I met Palestinians 28 years ago when I worked in the refugee camps and I discovered they were neither terrorists nor hateful people. They are the most gentle and kind people whom the world has forgotten and wronged. And I hope your generation will be the one that will right this wrong, whom my generation has failed to do. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. So I've also got another clip to go to that was uh, taken from a green belt uh, three years ago, back in uh, 2010. And uh, this is Christians dressed up as uh, Israeli soldiers and uh, trying to show what it's like for ordinary Palestinians, so-called living under Israeli occupation. But let's, uh, let's remember this actually demonizes Israel, this demonizes the Jewish people. The reason why Israel has checkpoints is to stop uh, terrorists like uh, Hezb Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and also m uh, terrorist organizations associated with Fatah, the ruling party, the Palestinian Authority, from carrying out terrorist attacks. And the reason why the security fence is built is to actually protect Israeli citizens from terror. Uh, and uh, it's been very, very successful. But uh, look and see how propaganda is used to stir up hatred against Israel and the Jewish people. This is the Christian Arts Festival. No good. This is no good. No good. Non Palestinians, three goes. The checkpoints go. The checkpoints go to Palestinians. Non Palestinians, three you go. Go away. Go away. Palestinians line up there. This is the reality. This is the reality. We are not because we have been why? there. What's wrong? Been have you are. seen it? It is awful. They queue from 4 a.m. to get through a checkpoint to get to work for and nine. It stops bombs from getting it in and killing stop people. Nothing. Yes, it's it not does. for security. It's between it Palestinian and Palestinian. You do exactly the same. Yes. If you lived in London. Not at all. You do not you put the clothes yes, about. We had cordons hey. around London when we the IRA were bombing, didn't we? We do not have checkpoints every few miles. You could not move out of Cheltenham for a checkpoint. And it's not true. That's a comfortable middle class uh, liberal Christian. This is not Palestine. <laughs> Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. As we see in that clip, it's truly shocking that uh, to think that a Christian uh, festival is organized for 20,000 people that should be about spreading the gospel and the message of uh, God's love. And yet uh, what we're seeing here is the victimization against Israel and against the Jewish people. It is becoming a central theme of the uh, Green Belt uh, Festival. We're now uh, joined on the phone by uh, Chrissy, who is a Christian Palestinian who can give some sort of uh, detail about what life is really like for Christians living under the Palestinian Authority. Uh, hello, Chrissy, and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. Hello. Hi, thank you for asking me to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure. But for our viewers, can you share something of your kind of extraordinary background and how you came to be living in the UK and certainly by uh, certainly the great work you're doing, exposing a lot of the lies and misinformation um, that the Palestinian Authority is putting out? Yeah, um, well, uh, I was back home in uh, Palestine. I was a law student and I was studying about human rights and freedom of speech. But I found out afterwards that this culture and this place lack big time of these rights. And the problem is that my people know what these rights are, so they don't know what they're missing. Therefore, my government is taking the advantage of misleading them, lying to them, and uh, misusing them and abusing them, basically. And um, Chrissy, I know that you attended the uh, the Green Belt uh, Festival at the weekend. Uh, also, know that you spoke to some of the organisers. What are the kind of things that you actually said to the organisers um, who are so concerned about the plight of the uh, Palestinians? 
Yes, uh, the kind of things were that I understood that they were concerned about my people and that touched my heart. But it wasn't just of them to just present one side of the story and not present the other side because in each story there's, there are both sides uh, and both uh, the situations and positions which needed to be presented. And as Greenbelt, it wasn't presented, sadly. Uh, so that's what I've been asking them, because what they're presenting is actually harming the Christians of Palestine big time, and they're not aware of it. My people, and it's so frustrating that my people has been taken as hostages for uh, the, the theologies that the churches have been creating and developing. And these churches have been doing these things, thinking that the radicals won't drive them out, and what the radical Islam won't drive them out of these places. But they're not aware that in a few years' time, they'll be driven out anyway. If you look at the percent of the Christians in Bethlehem, it dropped from 85% to 8% now. And they tell you all because of the occupation, that's what they say. But basically, what's really weird that the name, the number of Muslims is rising at the same time in that uh, area. So if if the, the occupation was the reason, therefore both people should be leaving that place. Why only Christians are leaving it? So there's a clear uh, picture here that the major problems that are the Christians, especially, and the Church of Palestine is facing is due to the radical Islam, the rising of radical Islam in that area. Yeah, uh, and, and this is what we see, sadly, by um, so many supporters like uh, Stephen Sizer and uh, organisations like Sabil and Embrace uh, Middle East. They take such a strong pro-Palestinian position, yet they seem to be so silent when it comes down to the persecutions of uh, Palestinian Christians by organizations like Hamas and even uh, by Fatah, the uh, ruling uh, authority within the Palestinian Authority. True, true. Sadly, this is the position, and it's due to what I would explain the, the situation is as Stockholm Syndrome. I don't know if you heard about this concept. It's when people, like Sabil uh, Institution, they start buying, they are hostages buying into the situation. And they, they forget that they've been captive and they're not having the rights. So they'd rather buy into the situation and adapt and, and instead of facing it because they'd face death. Yeah. Uh, and also, can you share with us as well, because uh, clearly the, uh, the suffering of the Palestinians is, is a horrendous thing. But why is it that Israel singled out and the likes of uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Kuwait, other Middle Eastern countries um, have a horrendous policy of discrimination, apartheid and oppression against the Palestinians? And yet the world is silent uh, regarding the treatment of, uh, of these Palestinian people that are in these Arab lands? Yeah, well, uh, sadly, if you look at the situation here, it is so sad for the, the Arabic people. My people are being mis mistreated and killed in that area. Uh, not only Palestinians and the whole Arab world, people are killing each other. And, and the problem is that they'd rather put the spotlight on Israel rather than facing their own problem and, and standing for it and say, well, we are doing pro mistakes. We're wrong we should stand and, and uh, up for it and change it but rather put the the blame on israel each time and that's the, the, it's it's the first that says uh, it's basically they should uh, look at the speck in their uh, the plank at their eyes instead of looking at the speck in israel's eyes awesome. and um uh, my, my final question really is that the fact that uh, it, the israeli society and also the israeli people and the government have done so much for peace um, particularly offering uh, Yasser Arafat at Camp David, uh, uh, the Camp David in 2000, uh, a Palestinian yeah. state um, in which they would then be free to govern their own affairs. But we saw that Arafat rejected that and, and turned to a wave of violence and terrorism in response. And also the fact that uh, the Palestinian Authority, also Hamas, 
are teaching Palestinian children to hate through their media and education system. Now, surely peace it will only really work if it comes from the ground up rather than the top down. Um, and so why, for example, do these groups not mention the hatred and incitement and the radicalization of uh, young Palestinians through the Palestinian media and education system today? Yes, again, because they don't want to look at it. Sadly, as you mentioned, the situation with Yasser Arafat, uh, well, he, all my people almost lo loved him when he was alive, but sadly they didn't know them. They weren't aware that he refused the peace uh, uh, agreement for the reasons of pride and money, sadly. I'm really frustrated and devastated to, to say that, but that this is the case. Hamas is using uh, education and media and even the honor war. They're using the, the honor war schools and places to incite uh, hatred uh, in the education as well. Uh, there's lots of hatred. And the, the Christian organizations like Sabil and other uh, Christians, they are not putting the light on, on these things because, again, it's a matter of death and life. They're not admitting that actually Israel, uh, the Hamas is inciting hatred because it's a matter of death and life for them. They'd rather not face it. They're so frightened to stand up for it. Yeah. I want to thank you so much uh, for joining me today, Chrissy. And uh, we've had to reveal, we had to conceal your identity for your own personal safety. So thank you for your courage and thank you for your bravery. And thank you for prepared to speak the truth despite the personal uh, cost to you personally. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. OK, thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Uh, a very brave Girl. Uh, obviously, Chrissy's not a real name. Um, she has that name just to kind of protect herself. But she's willing to really stand against the lies and the propaganda. And I suppose uh, this is the thing that concerns me the most, um, Mike, is the fact that they, they buy into the uh, Palestinian propaganda and lies and yet do nothing about the uh, or say anything about the uh, suicide bombings against Israel. They say nothing about the rockets and missiles that fall, fall upon Israeli towns and cities, as we saw last November. Uh, they say nothing about the hatred and the incitement to hatred through the Palestinian education system and their media. And uh, also they don't also state Israel's right to exist. It's it's a completely anti-Israel position, which, in my opinion, is completely completely ungodly. Well, it, it is ungodly, but it's also unjust. And I think that's the, the point of, of Chrissy's uh, uh, presentation there. It's, it, it's un there are injustices taking place for Palestinian Arab Christians and for anybody who supports Israel. I don't know whether you're aware, but uh, Stephen Curry's church in East Jerusalem which is a Christian church that supports the, the Old Testament and the prophecies for Israel, that was torched this last week in East Jerusalem. Now, that's not freedom. And I, I want to go back to the clip from the, uh, the first clip that you gave with the Chinese doctor, the lady who said that the Palestinians are a lovely, gentle people. I've met many. She is absolutely right. And that's another reason why I want to see the truth coming out, because between 1967 and 2000, when Israel governed the Palestinian people in Israel, the quality and the standard of living was far higher than it ever was before under Egyptian rule or after under, uh, under uh, you mean uh, Jordanian, PA's, rule. Jordanian yeah. rule, I'm yeah. sorry, and under Egypt's rule in Gaza. They, they had a far better standard of living. And under Hamas today, Palestinian Arabs are suffering. They can't speak out. They can't... Uh, uh, talk about it, they're Israeli friends who they had a close relationship before with, in 2005. The Gush Katif community are an example of that, who were evacuated in 2005 from their homes in Gaza. Eight, eight and a half thousand Israeli civilians taken from their homes for the promise of peace by Arafat and his, uh, his authorities. And yet they didn't have peace at all. They left their friends in Gaza who have since been persecuted. You've seen the pictures, surely, of, of the executions of those who have collaborated with Israel in Gaza. The summary executions and the bodies being dragged behind motorcycles because they've rang a friend in Israel. Is that, a, is that freedom? Is, is Sabeel and Greenbelt and those who, who are involved in those uh, organizations, Embrace Middle East, speaking for freedom? 
No, they're, they're sowing into and preparing for a state which will oppress women, which will abuse children, and also a state which will be so fueled up to destroy every Jew in, in the Middle East, which is what Hamas and the PF, PA have said. So it, it is an emotive issue, and, and Christy is, is, is speaking in terms of what is the church going to do for the Palestinian Christians? We have to get behind an Israeli state for freedoms for the Palestinian Christians because they were free before 2000, before Arafat. And, and, and we have to, to, to release the money that Arafat stole. He, he, he divested $560 million of aid money going from Europe into his own bank accounts that didn't reach the Palestinian people. Those really nice people who we should be fighting for. Embrace should be fighting for those. Uh, Sabil should be fighting for those. Stephen Sizer should be fighting for those people because they are you know, people like you and I who deserve freedoms. They're not going to get it under a Palestinian Arab regime. That's been proved historically. They'll only get that living under the governance of Israel. So, Chrissy, I just want to bless you for what you said and because it is the truth. Absolutely. Uh, we've got another clip to go to now, and this is a personal diary taken from uh, Greenbelt at 2010, part of the uh, Justice Camp. All throughout the Greenbelt Camp, they have these placards uh, with um, trivia tips about in Gaza. If Greenbelt was Gaza, half the day there would be no power for music or talks. Um, again, this is from the Just Peace group. Okay, this is the Just Peace booth um, that Wesley was talking about. Um, panning over here, this is a wall that they built to represent uh, the wall is eight meters high. It's the same height as the wall in Palestine that the Israelis built. Just to give you an idea of what the Palestinians are going through. Here's another of the placards. If Greenbelt was Gaza, sorry, no exit. And you might be wondering what that means. In 2007, Israel imposed a blockade on the Gaza Strip, making it impossible for residents to leave and near impossible for anyone to enter. And this morning, um, on the main walkway, they had a reenactment of two Palestinian women who were trying to uh, trying to leave and they had two soldiers there telling them that they were not allowed to leave even though they had the proper papers and this is something uh, that has been going on since 2007 uh, farmers can't get to their land to work it um, families can't get to other family members and this is something that Just Peace is uh, working to change and there are some details for more information. Greenbelt was Gaza. 14,700 of us would be refugees. And there's just a queue of people waiting to get into the children's area just to give you an idea of how many people are here. All these people, pretty much all of them, would be refugees if we were in Gaza. Here again is a picture of a lot of our tents, where the majority of the people are living this weekend. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, that clip should make you angry because it makes me extremely angry. Uh, the fact that Israel had to build a security fence in the first place was because of the wave of suicide bombers that were attacking Israel. They were attacking s schools, uh, they were attacking uh, um, cafes, restaurants, buses. 
um, in the most horrendous and despicable manner. The fact now that Israel has this security fence means that Israel faces no threat of uh, suicide bombings at all, which has done more to actually create peace between the uh, two sides, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, Mike, I, I'm just disgusted really with that propaganda and actually fact of trying to build the so-called wall uh, at a Christian festival that, that's purely designed to just demonize Israel and the Jewish people. And uh, I'm sick and tired of this, to be yeah. honest. That's my personal thing. This is despicable propaganda, really, because if Greenbelt was Gaza, then the people of Greenbelt wouldn't be able to grow their hair. Men would have to have their hair cut. In the last two months, eight young men who have had long hair have been taken off the streets in Gaza, taken to a police station and had their head shaved just because they got long hair. They're not allowed to wear certain types of clothing. If Greenbelt was Gaza, then all the children we saw at Greenbelt would have been taken to the summer camps run by Hamas, which teach 100,000 children aged between 12 and 16 to fire guns and rockets and carry suicide belts into Israeli homes and into their restaurants, etc. If Greenbelt was Gaza, women would not have the freedoms that they have in Greenbelt today. What's going on here in Greenbelt? They've got it wrong, and that's the, that's the frustration. And also, that with the, war, the, the issue with the wall, I interviewed in their hospital beds people who had been bombed in Maxime's restaurant in 2005 and and they were devastated by the extent of the bombing where 50 odd people had been injured 23 killed simply because there was no security and now we've got security the green belt and its supporters are saying that israel doesn't need security or doesn't have the right to defend their citizens that statement is anti-semitic because if you afford rights to other nations that you don't afford to Israel, that one nation, then that statement has to be anti-Semitic. So I'm sorry yeah. I'm, I'm a bit emotive, Simon, but I know the facts on the ground because I've been there and I know what's happening in Gaza. It's really yeah. sad. Yeah. Human rights are not being uh, upheld in Gaza and Greenbelt oh. are upholding Absolutely. that situation. Uh, and for my own personal thing, I had a, a friend who was killed in a, a terrorist attack in Israel. Um, back in 2002. Uh, I've also been to areas that have been devastated by kind of suicide bombings. And to say that Israel's n allowed no security against a terrorist organization that's not only committed to Israel's destruction, but also in their covenant charter calls for the destruction of the state of Israel. Now, Greenbelt have put out um, a statement. Uh, this is uh, Greenbelt Festival have uh, put out a statement on the uh, Israel-Palestinian uh, programming, uh, Greenbelt, and this is what they state. Greenbelt attempts to make links with people in situations around the world struggling for justice and peace and give them a stage. We view this as part of our mission. In addition, in terms of our programming on highlighting issues around Israel-Palestine, Greenbelt also aligns itself with the resolutions of international law joined up by the Na United Nations that deems the continued Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories as illegal, the separation wall being built since 2002 two as illegal and the continued building of the Israeli settlements in the West Bank as illegal. Uh, um, so, I mean, looking at that statement, firstly, uh, it's down to the two sides between the Israelis and the Palestinians as part of the Oslo Accords to come to their own final conclusion, their own peace treaty in terms, this is why we've got the final status uh, issue to deal with the status of Jerusalem and the so-called refugee problem. But, but also to say that uh, the separation wall, which was built purely as a defensive measure, and then thirdly, that uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank are illegal, which is the biblical heartland of the Jewish people. And uh, not only that is that uh, they want this to be Juden free, and yet Israel has a population, 10% uh, of Israel's population are Arab. Yeah. Can I focus on this issue regarding refugees? Because that's what Greenbelt focused on. In, since 1948, 796,000 Palestinian Arab refugees were created on the day of independence or thereafter because the Arab, their Arab governments told them, told the Palestinian Arabs to, living in Israel to get out of the land because they were going to blow Israel out of the, uh, out of the sea, basically, out of the, 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 the district. At the same time, and this is what Greenbelt don't mention, and this is, this is the imbalance of it all, 
856,000 Jewish refu refugees were created by Arab lands when they were, these, ref these Jews were thrown out of their lands and property which they'd lived in for a thousand years. E and that More land of property years equally, goes back to yeah, the, equaling uh, to four Babylon. times the size of Israel. Yeah. And there was a bigger Jewish refugee problem than there was a Palestinian Arab problem. Now, the world, and quite rightly, have thrown money and after money at the Palestinian uh, uh, Arab refugee problem to help those people. No money has been given to the Jewish refugees. The money that's been sent to the Palestinian Arab refugees has not got through. And today, we can't really call them refugees. They've been there for 50 years. They are being used as a tool to buy the Palestinian Arabs, and clearly now many within, uh, within the leadership in Christendom, as, as a tool to destroy the nation of Israel. All these references, occupation, refugees are, are not balanced with truth and fact and, and I think we really need to stop using these terminolo this terminology we shouldn't use Pal Palestinian Arab refugees they're not they're living in houses and if you look at Gaza and the Palestinian Authority areas if you go to Ramallah or Janine or in places in Gaza some of these houses are luxurious we w I would love to live in some of those places with the swimming pools in. It's, there's not a refugee issue here. It, and, and there's not an issue of occupation. It's an issue of terrorists living in the region who have an agenda to destroy Israel and using every tool possible, including their own people. Yeah, which is, which is sadly, this is probably the crux of the problem, um, particularly with the Palestinians, is the uh, failed leadership that they have and also the failure of the world to recognize what's really going on uh, and that is the oppression of Palestinians living in Arab lands uh, which they're very much silent on but one thing that um, does concern me so much with Greenbelt is this theological shift that we're seeing uh, this embracing the social gospel um, but not only embracing the social gospel but also embracing this new term of uh, Christian Palestinianism uh, which is now developing and emerging as the new uh, liberation theology. Uh, and really, at the heart of this is church replacement theology, isn't it? Absolutely. Their leaders teach that Jesus was a Palestinian. The, the, you see the Christmas cards and the Christmas carols talking about Mary and Joseph being Palestinians. They were Jews. I've heard one leader in the, in the anti-Israel um, charitable status organizations uh, saying that Jesus was a Semite from an Oriental religion. What's that about? It's the has, it's got to be the Palestinization of Jesus and 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 the Palestinian Arabs um, with an agenda to take away the Jewishness of our faith because we're rooted, we're grafted into Israel. And this um, story of replacement theology that's been around for 1800 years has caused Christendom to be the most aggressive force against Israel. And you think we'd have learned from history. Have we learned from history? It doesn't appear so. It, because replacement theology enables one to persecute the Jewish people because we say we have nothing to do with them. Therefore, there's a separation. And actually, that is the beginning of dehumanizing the Jews and Israel. And, and, and that will cause this, this uh, hatred to grow. Therefore, it, 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 it's more insidious than we see it on the surface. It's really dangerous. And, and we need to learn from our history and we need to look at the scriptures again and read what God's heart is for Israel. God says in, in Ezekiel 36, he says, I'm gathering the Jews back to the land to give glory to my name. Why can't we praise God for that today? Why can't Jeremy Moody, Stephen Sizer, Paul Northup, and all those at Greenbelt say, yeah, it's glory to God. You know, that, we, that God's, God's promises are being fulfilled in our lifetime. And let's help the Palestinians by giving them a government, government, a government which is going to give them democracy and give them prosperity and wealth instead of enforcing them to have a government which is basically a terrorist organization. We've got to change. We've got to do something. And I just want to ask your viewers to get on board with this and be a voice in this time. 
Yeah, we've got another clip to go to, and uh, this is something you won't hear at Greenbelt, uh, what Hamas is actually like in their control of uh, the Gaza Strip. Ten facts about Hamas. The Hamas is a Palestinian Islamic organization founded in 1987 in Gaza as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. The Hamas Charter explicitly calls for the obliteration of Israel. The Charter repeats medieval and Nazi anti-Semitic rhetoric accusing Jews of controlling the world media and of causing all the world's past wars and revolutions. Hamas is responsible for 40% of suicide terror attacks in Israel, which resulted in hundreds of civilian casualties. In June 2007, Hamas seized control over the Gaza Strip and began imposing an extremist religious rule. Hamas government is responsible for extrajudicial executions of all opposition, persecution of journalists, and shutting down human rights organizations. Hamas persecutes Gaza's Christians. Between the years 2007 and 2011, the Christian population in Gaza has dropped by 45%. Between 2001 and 2012, Hamas has fired 12,000 rockets into Israel, more than 9,000 of them after Israel withdrew completely from Gaza in 2005, and evacuated thousands of Israeli families in the hopes of achieving peace. Hamas war tactics include placing ammunition and rocket launchers in hospitals and mosques and near schools in violation of the Geneva Convention. Hamas is supported by Iran, from which it receives an estimated $300 million per year, military training, and rockets which are fired into Israel's civilian towns. The United States, the European Union, Canada, and Japan all classify Hamas as a terrorist organization. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. And we've got one more clip to go to from Greenbelt. I think it's important that we uh, just show some of the propaganda and lies they are teaching 20,000 Christians and why uh, those who have a heart and a love and a passion for Israel should be very concerned and very alarmed. Okay, I am in front of the Just Peace um, booth and um, sorry, what was your name? Wesley. Wesley is going to um, just give a short explanation about what Just Peace is. Uh, so it was nearly two years ago now when a group of us from Greenbelt went to the West Bank. Uh, with the Amos Trust and we were staying in Bethlehem, we went to Jerusalem, to Hebron and we met a lot of Palestinians, uh, Israelis, uh, Muslims who were working out there and it just, it really moved us all so much, like the shocking injustice of the whole situation, the oppression of the Palestinian people, that we felt that Greenbelt really had to take a stance on this and Greenbelt had to stand up and make its voice heard amongst the others and so that's what the Just Peace campaign is trying to do, trying to raise awareness of the conflict in Israel-Palestine. Uh, we got a whole a huge program of speakers, a really great program of speakers throughout the weekend and hopefully we'll be able to get people talking, get people thinking um, and hopefully get people acting. Um, we'll be talking the culmination of this, this weekend will be when we're having a discussion on the boycott, whether or not it's right to boycott Israel and Israeli goods. Um, and hopefully that will then lead into a decision that the trustees may make on whether Greenbelt should take the official stance to boycott Israeli goods, which would be a, a huge thing. And that is something that, from my experience, um, seems to be something that we as a Western country, a big supporter of Israel, can do to, to make our, our, sort of our voice heard and uh, help the Palestinian people use our economic power to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a great range of stuff on and hopefully a lot of people Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, there we saw in that clip uh, a, a young uh, Christian uh, calling for boycott uh, against uh, Israeli goods. Um, you know, what does the world come to? That's all I can say. Um, Mike, again, uh, here we go. Boycott, uh, the Green Belt are boycotting Israeli goods and produce produced in Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland of Israel. They're encouraging young people to take up this cause against Israel. Yeah. And uh, all I can say is how can God bless them? If it says in his word, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel because surely they're cursing the God of Israel and the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 
Of course they are, and they're cursing what God is doing in that land. He's, he's starting to bless the land now. It's prospering. It's, it, it's uh, growing fruit and vegetables for the rest of the world, and, and we're all enjoying it. And it's, also, it's also providing all the, the IT equipment that you have here and, uh, and, and you have in your homes, the computers, etc. And to call for a boycott is economically damaging for the Palestinian Arabs. Palestinian Arabs that work in Israeli industry earn three times more than they would if they worked for their own people. That's the story. Palestinian Arabs ha ha are being employed by Jews because they work very well together. They have different skills. Palestinian Arabs would prefer, those that I've met, would prefer to work for Israeli companies because they get equality, they get fair play. I, there are, and, and, and this is little known, but there are Palestinian Arab, Arabs from Gaza living in Steros because they don't want to live in Gaza, because they don't get a fair crack of the whip. And the BDS movement is again another agenda which brings falsehoods, un untruths, so that Israel would be damaged through propaganda in our supermarkets and, and in our universities. Uh, and, and Mike, we're less than uh, three minutes of the programme, so it's, it's, become, uh, it's gone very, very fast. Mm. Now, uh, we've got to thank um, a lot of our viewers, and I want to thank you, all of those who wrote to me uh, concerning this issue to do a programme on it. So I'm um, doing a programme on it now. But what would you say? I mean, it's incredible that you've got 100 Christians willing to um, stand uh, with you outside uh, the uh, Cheltenham race course at the weekend, uh, which is incredible. But how can we encourage more Christians to make a stand? And, and why is this issue so important and close to God's heart? This is something that we should really get involved in and actually take action and get ourselves involved well, first of all, I want to thank everybody who, who emailed me as well as you, but also emailed Greenbelt with their concern because we had about 120 people standing outside Greenbelt's main entrance but they were just a fraction of the people who emailed and said they couldn't go for one reason or another and many of the Bible based Christians are uh, uh, many of them are elderly and not able to get there so but I want to thank you all for all that you did to give a voice because Greenbelt have now recognized and have said they recognize there is a voice from the biblical based uh, pro Israel community so that's a good thing what we need to do is to uh, join with networks and organizations that are supporting biblical truths and Israel. There's, there's many out there, CFI and Bridges and all these organizations. Uh, so, Mike, thank you very thank much you. for being my guest on the Middle East Report. Sadly, comes the end of the program, so keep up the good work you're doing. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank you for watching today's program. I, I, I believe that we should be very concerned because we're seeing a rise of anti-Semitism uh, throughout Europe and also in Britain once again. We're seeing a delegitimization of the Jewish state. But now we're seeing uh, an emergence of a new theology emerge within Christian circles, and uh, which is anti-Semitic, it's very hard. It's time to wake up, and it's time to condemn such actions in the name of Christ. So we're going to leave you with this song, which is a little bit more upbeat, which celebrates the nation of Israel, and how we should all be proud to uh, wave the Jewish flag of Israel. And thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Par ספטולה, ללא יד שמלטפת, רק בחושך מרחפת, מול הרוע והשקר, מגמגמת, מתחמקת, מבקשת, מהססת, מקווה ומחפשת, את ניצוץ האור, ולעצמה לחזור, עוד יום ועוד מכה. שותקת ומחכה, תראו שיום עוד יגיע, שחר יפציע, ידו תוחזת, דגל כחול הגרש צועקת, די כבר לשקר, ידו תוחזת, דגל כחול לבן, כחול לבן, כחול לבן, כחול לבן, ישתף לו כל הרוע מפינה קטנה בודדת שוב יאיר פתאום הצדק מהשפל והסבל הצביעות וגם האבל תעלה שוב מחוזקת לא נשברת נאבקת על מי
ניצוץ האור, ולעצמה לחזור. הקול שבליבה, עוד שר את התקווה. תראו שיום עוד יגיע, שחר יפציע, ידו דוחזת, דגל כחול עבר את צועקת, די כבר לשקר, ידו דוחזת, דגל כחול לבן, כחול לבן, כחול לבן, כחול לבן, או-או-או-או 